The best time of the year is upon us. Football is back, MLB playoffs are just around the corner, and your favorite artists are out on tour. But did you know you can go to events like these for half off or more when you buy tickets last minute with Game Time? GameTime is the fastest growing ticketing app that guarantees the lowest price on tickets to all your favorite sports, concerts, and shows. You can see the view from your seat in the app and checkout takes less than 30 seconds. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and redeem code DK20 for $20 off your first purchase. Again, that's DK20 for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Download GameTime. Last minute tickets. Lowest price. Guaranteed. This is the Dan Levator Show with the Stugatz Podcast. This is how I spent my evening last night because uh, Mike Schur and Joe Posnanski know a ton about baseball and their podcast is sort of about baseball, but not reason, not really. You should check it out. The podcast as part of the Levitard and Friends Network, but... I was, you know, Kyle Schwarber has 36 home runs and 78 RBI, and I will never get used to that. And Mike Schur is like, it's a lot worse than that. And who was that? The Buxton guy? What is he? 28 home runs and 51 RBI this season is what it is that baseball is giving you. 28 home runs and 51 RBI does not seem possible. Yeah, that's a that's an extreme one. But Trout is like 31, 61 now or something. Like there's a bunch of guys who are barely over two RBI per home run and Buxton's under. So it's just a factor of nobody hitting, nobody getting on base, the shift taking away base hits that then mean that no one's on when you hit a home run. I mean, 2851 is insane. Like that's that's intense, even for a guy who hits leadoff. Uh that's that's bananas. But like that's just what happens when nobody when hitting is down across the league, then no one's on base. So the home runs are solo shots. Well, Poznanski was saying that that guy, Buxton, his, uh, he's with men on third. He's one for 19. He's hitting with people in scoring position, 145. And he was saying that just on base percentage league average is now 310. That used to be, you know, a good batting average. And now the league average on on base percentage is, uh, is so low that that a, that a failure rate of three out of ten times getting on base is the uh, is the average for every major leaguer. That's crazy. Yeah, but that's also what happens when you have incredible amounts of data that tell you exactly where a guy's going to hit the ball. We've talked about this before. The a, a, a ball ripped up the middle used to be a hit every time, and it's now a, a ground out to the shortstop. And a ball pulled by a left-handed hitter that lands. 100 feet out in right field used to be a base hit. Now it's a easy line drive to the second baseman who's playing a softball position. And the pitchers are all throwing 99 with insane movement. And so the margin for error in terms of actually making contact with the ball has never been smaller. And then you get a bunch of guys who are it's home run or bust. It's a bummer. Let's go ahead and do stat of the day. What are you guys laughing we're just, about back we're there? Sp- we're trying to fix baseball. What do you guys think about putting a cap on miles per hour? Yeah. If it's 100 miles an hour, ball. Like softball, you're allowed oh. to hit like two home runs an inning, and if you hit a home run, it's an out. Yeah, caught for speeding? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Ooh, speeding tickets. Oh, man, I like this. Mm. You want people to throw less hard? Uh-huh. I'm just saying, people seem to be complaining. Oh, nowadays, everyone throws so hard. Let's make no, it easier on the hitters. Cap your speed. Guys, it's it's beyond hard now, because, like, Mike Sure has been sending me. I mean, not the name, but Mike Sure texts <laughs> me sometimes. But, like, it's just, like, insane movements. Like, this is a 105-mile-an-hour sinker. This is a 103-mile-an-hour ball that's yeah. just moving horizontally right. 20 inches. <laughs> it's becoming a two-seamer running in at your hands. impossible to hit the ball. Yeah. And it's not just velocity. It's the movement with the velocity. I was watching last night. Don't ask me why. Phillies, Marlins, and Bryce Harper. Gambling again. Oh, no, Bryce team. Harper has had 162 games against the Marlins, and basically against just the Marlins, all of it is you know 30 homers, 111 RBI. All the counting stats and all the advanced stats are great. And he's facing Luzardo, and he strikes out three times, and has no chance against anything. Like now, this is this is the Marlins' third or fourth starter, and he's and he's throwing from the left side. And Bryce Harper just keeps striking out and is late on everything, and that's as good as they come. Because how about this? How about this? Four or five, something like that, five times a game, every pitcher has to throw a pitch with his non-dominant hand. 
So Lazardo has to throw right handed like three times in in the uh, first five innings. What happened or to that like guy that. that would switch gloves on the mound? Dude, Do you remember him? Yo, Greg W. Gloves. Harris. He was an ambidextrous <laughs> pitcher. Yeah, the switch pitcher. <laughs> I saw a switch quarterback thing on Twitter the other day, and people were like, this is going to change the league, because the guy was like running around, throwing the ball right-handed and then left-handed, and I'm looking, I'm like, this guy's like 5'6", a buck 35. Like, this guy will get absolutely <laughs> destroyed in the NFL. My son showed me that. My son rushed in and showed me this something on TikTok or whatever. It was like, this guy, this quarterback throws with both of his hands, and then I was like, cool, and he was like, he thought for a second, and then he was like, how would that help him? And I was like, it won't. Like, like, <laughs> <laughs> what an interesting discovery to make after he's presenting it to you. As I guess a you're, never, you're, you're never throwing across your body, I suppose. Like if you're rolling out to your left, yeah. rolling out to so your left, twi- you throw twice to your a left. game. He'll he'll roll to his left, switch hands, and then try to throw a pass left-handed. When Mahomes, so Mahomes so does sick. it anyway. So yeah. <laughs> Let's go ahead and do the stat of the day. Star of the day, star of the day, it is the star of the day. Star of the day, star of the day, it is the star of the day. Star of the day, star of the day, it is the star of the day. Star of the day, star of the day, it is the star of the day. Congratulations to the Minnesota Twins who did not lose to the New York Yankees last night because the game has rained out. But since 2002, and we've talked about this before on the podcast and I think on this show too, the Minnesota Twins are 37 and 96 against the Yankees and 2 and 16 against them in the playoffs, including 13 straight postseason losses dating back to 2004. That's a 39 and 112 record which is a 258 winning percentage in almost a full season's worth of games. There are only five teams who have had a worse winning percentage over the course of a season since the turn of the century than the Twins have against the Yankees, and none since World War II. The 1962 (laughs) Mets, that famous, terrible, hapless team that finished 60 and a half games out of first place, had a better winning percentage than the Twins have against the Yankees over the last 20 years. And in 1992-93... And this really, I think, puts it into perspective, guys. Manute Bowl had a higher three-point percentage than the Twins have a winning percentage against the Yankees (laughs) since 2002. What was that record? It is one of the weirdest ongoing. Their total record against the Yankees is 39 and 112 over the last 20 seasons. They got their number, Daniel. It's good analysis by you. That is crazy. What did you uh, What did you make of this here? I saw that the Mets lost to the Pirates last night, and it's the first time since 1938 that they've gone three straight days. A team 35 games over 500 has gone three straight times into playing a team uh, 35 games under 500 and lost all three games. <laughs> as Stugatz worries that the Mets, well, the Mets have been caught by the Braves now, right? Yeah, the Braves tied them up last night. This is, uh, uh, by the way, I think that stat was put on Twitter by Stats by Stats, the at Stats by Stats uh, handle, which I should clean up from yesterday's. I got my stat yesterday from them. They're great. You should all check them out. That Mets thing, the Mets are still really good, but they lost Scherzer, uh, and they've had a they've had a couple of guys hit slumps at the wrong time, and Scherzer's skipping a start, and like some other guys are hurt, and. That's uh, if I can borrow a phrase from Tim Kirkchen, this is what you love about baseball is that every day you see something you've never seen before. And they just lost three straight games against three of the worst teams in baseball as they continue to be one of the best teams in baseball. It's amazing. Mike, uh, Jeff Passan tweeted uh, yesterday a blind taste test of four different players in their stats. Player A and player this. B are hitters. Yeah. Player C and player D are pitchers. And basically, the stats are very comparable. 20, uh, 283 batting average, 33 home runs, 74 RBI versus player B, 270, 32 home runs, 85 RBI. And then for the pitchers, 147 innings pitched and 27% uh, strikeout rate and 2.2 ERA. And then player D, 136 innings pitched, 27% strikeout rate and 2.58 ERA. And then he reveals what the blind taste test is. Mookie Betts is player A. Shane McClanahan mm-hmm. is player C. Shohei Otani is the other two guys. 
That's right. So he's hitting like Mookie Betts and he's pitching like Shane McClanahan. And yeah. so <laughs> help me wrap my head around this, Mike, as someone who is not an avid baseball He's got to be the MVP, correct, Mike? They're not going to – he's got to be the MVP, correct? He is the MVP. Judge is going to win because people love the story of a Yankee dragging his team to to glory. Uh, and he's slightly ahead. If you just add their wars, if you just add Otani's pitching war to his hitting war, Judge is like, they're basically even, but Judge is slightly ahead. But that doesn't matter to me because Otani's top 10 in both OPS in the league and also uh, fielding independent pitching, which is basically just a better ERA. His his OPS is is right between Jose Altuve and and Freddie Freeman, and his fielding independent uh, pitching is between Max Fried and Justin Verlander. <laughs> so he's basically he's roughly Freddie Freeman or or Altuve as a hitter, and he's roughly Max Fried or Verlander as a pitcher. Verlander might win the Cy Young, <laughs> like Freddie Freeman is a dark horse MVP candidate. Like the idea that those guys are the same guy is not it's i mean to help you wrap your head around it imagine that a guy uh in the in football led the league in yards passing and also tackles or that a basketball player led the league in both three point percentage and block shots and one defensive player of the year and also assists and rebounds or I don't, it's hard it's impossible that there's no comp for this like it's never happened before the stat i gave yesterday was that he has had six games of two or more homers as a hitter and nine games of 10 or more strikeouts as a pitcher. And no one else in the history of the game has ever had six of each kind of game for a career. And he's done it just this season. Like, it it doesn't make any sense. It's it's uh, honestly, the best comp would be is if someone were the, were, uh, were the best quarterback in the league and also the best middle linebacker. Like, that's as close as you can get to so, trying to approximate it in another Given sport. that... Why isn't he a bigger deal? Because he plays in Anaheim, California, where the games on the East Coast start at 10 p.m. and uh, no one watches them. And Anaheim stinks. The team stinks, and they're they're 20 games under 500, and no one they haven't been relevant in years. Uh, and so no one. I mean, the the league is trying, like the they're trying to make him into a big deal, but. I mean, you can't make any baseball player a big deal because nobody watches the games nationally. There's no national equivalent of Sunday at four for baseball. So as a result, like just no one really is paying attention. And I think we talked about this yesterday, but I think he's going to play on a different team very soon. I think he's going to go to, I don't know, he's, he'll go to the Mets or he'll go to the, even if he just went 40 miles north and played for the Dodgers, he'd be a much bigger deal so I think he just chose like a sort of weird black hole to play in. And so no one cares about him. I mean, it, it, people care about him, but he he hasn't like captured the right. nation's consciousness the way that he should have. What can baseball do, though? Because like we spoke earlier this year when the Angels were coming down to face the Marlins and Shohei and Sandy missed each other by a day in terms of yeah. pitching. But baseball plays every single day. So you can't just kind of create those matchups if you're the Major League Baseball, right? Like you can't decide, hey angels move someone back a day so we get this primetime game that everyone can watch so how how can they fix it i don't know i mean and even if they could would anybody would the nation be captivated by angels marlins on a random saturday or whatever in in may probably not right like that's part of the problem is just the game's national popularity it's completely atomized it's 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 a, a city it's a local market game now and you can't, there's there's like three times a year when he can has the opportunity to capture the nation's attention. That's like the all-star break and maybe, I don't know, maybe that's really it, <laughs> the all-star break. I mean, what they should do is they, they, should, they should be setting up the Angels or whatever team he's on to play at every meaningful game that they can. So like if they do the Field of Dreams game next year, which I assume they will, the Angels should play in the Field of Dreams game. If they have any kind of like July 4th, festivities they should have the angels play on july 4th in prime time like they should do whatever they can to put him front and center but even then i don't think that there's a way that he can break through the way that a football player or a basketball player can break through it just doesn't happen in baseball anymore what if what if he played for the yankees that would help i mean you know that there it, like there's basically the marquee franchises that matter yankees red sox dodgers kind of the mets now 
sort of the Cardinals, but not really. Like that would help a little. I mean, obviously anybody who plays for the Yankees gets a gets to be a bigger deal than they were before. But even then, I don't know that there's a the a, a version of of any baseball player, including Shohei Otani, who's where Ken Griffey Jr. was when he was a star. I just don't think it can happen now. Um, but they should try they, because he's he's their best chance to recapture some of that the nation's attention that they used to have. Put them in piss stripes. We've got another Sui for you here. Best story coming at the end of the hour. But I wanted to talk, and you've mentioned this before, the way that science and aging have changed in sports. Uh, one of the best point guards ever, 41 years old. Sue Bird has called it a career, four-time champion, 13-time all-star, five gold medals, NCAA champion, uh, as well, it is really amazing to me, Mike, to see athletes still playing into their 40s in a in a young man's game. We lose two legends here this week with Serena and uh, Sue Bird. Uh, just best we've ever seen type of uh, like you. You could say goat without it being a dilution on goat on both of those and and pioneers that uh, that have had to have strength that even the men don't have in order to build their sports up. Yeah. I mean, she was the best point guard in college. Uh, she was the best point guard in the WNBA almost immediately upon arriving in the WNBA. Uh, in her, whatever it was, second or third to last game, she drilled a corner three with one second left to give her team a two-point lead in a playoff game. Like, she's still doing all most of the stuff that she did when she was a 19-year-old in at UConn. She's the best, man. I've loved watching her play. My older sister went to UConn, and I've been a UConn basketball fan my whole life. And the women's team has been, generally speaking, more fun to root for than the men's team. And I love that team. I love the Tarasi teams and the Sue Bird teams. Those are the teams of like my formative years as a fan. And I, it is, it is amazing to think like to remember how long ago I was rooting for her at UConn, and that she's still playing until yesterday. She's the best, you know, that it, it is not just a, a it's, I, I think, a testament not only to the technology and the science and the nutrition and everything else, but just to like the determination that certain athletes have to just be great and continue being great for as long as possible. Like, I think that has changed a little. I think people used to call it a career a little earlier because they'd be achy and they, you know, their knees would creak or whatever. And now I think there's like, there's a certain kind of athlete who's just like, I'm not leaving until I decide I'm leaving. And that's like a new kind of cool mentality that certain people have. She's one of them. Mike, good talking to you. Thank you, sir. Always good catching up with you. We'll talk to you tomorrow. All right, folks. See you tomorrow. Darren Ravel writes on Twitter, I mean, like it or not, Pat McAfee is the most powerful talent in sports media. And then the member of our army, newsreader 2242, mm. writes in, Dan Levitard would like a word. Uh huh. And then Darren Ravel writes back, about what? Oh, God <laughs> damn. <laughs> oh, that's good. Chris, I thought of you yesterday when they announced the Paul Anderson Silva fight because I'm figuring that you're going to love this, even though Anderson Silva is one in seven in the last decade. One, He's one in seven, and uh, Jake Paul is doing such a good job of picking opponents because Anderson Silva at the time was the best pound for pound fighter in the history of MMA. But again, one in seven in the last 10 years. But if you look at the quotes of like people like who are his big biggest critics, uh, Dana White, he has said, been quoted, he, Jake will never take the fight with Anderson Silva. He has kind of held Anderson up as the guy in the range of people he could fight that could beat him. So I think it's, it's a good spot because if Jake wins, Dane is gonna have to eat some crow. Silva's a better striker than than Woodley than than anybody. I think that Jake Paul has has fought. But again, though, he's in his mid forties and and ten years at one and seven. It, it just Paul is very smart about the opponent that he keeps picking, where he's picking names, but guys uh, guys less likely to harm him than most. Tony, you're our MMA guy. Anderson Silva, pretty damn spent. Yes. 
in MMA standards, right? The thing is, he's an elite striker, and his boxing has been out of control. He's been knocking people out and sparring. Like, he is a legitimate boxer, so it's a huge test for Jake Paul to actually fight somebody who is a fighter, right? Like, now he's a boxer. That's what Anderson Silva's been doing for the last, I don't know, couple of years now. So this is going to be a massive fight. We actually might have a little MMA hangout for the uh, Jake Paul and uh, Anderson Silva fight. Does this do nothing? Ah! Oh. Hey, Dan, it's Billy over here in the kitchen area. So I got to first take a little late to the party today because we were doing Saturday. But Stephen A. was going up against Jeff Saturday, and I think Mad Dog was on Jeff Saturday's team against Stephen A. We'll get back to that in a second. So when I walked in, they were in the middle of an argument where they were having the Eagles against the Cowboys and who was going to win the East. So then Stephen A. yelled very emphatically, the champions of what? And it was the champions of the division. They were going back and forth. And Stephen A. was arguing that the Cowboys will not win the division. Jeff Saturday was befuddled by this. And then Stephen A. said, you can always pick, you can pick anyone else in the division to win because the Cowboys are not going to win back to back. No one ever does. That's not what they're going to do. Cowboys won't win the division back to back. And then first take started playing what I thought was a mistake because it was like this weird sad music that was going on and I was looking around and I asked Mike Fuentes I go what is that because I thought maybe someone's phone was going off someone was watching YouTube I don't know what it was it was first take they were playing a sad Cowboys fan montage with very sad dramatic music underneath while they were doing the debate which was a great touch then Stephen A called the NFC East the NFC least then Mad Dog popped in for the first time in the segment that I caught where he said Jalen Hurts got beat out by Tua who got beat out by Fitzpatrick to argue against the Eagles even though I believe that he was arguing for the Eagles because he was going against Stephen A. It was confusing. You know that Stephen A is not arguing on behalf of the Cowboys. So then they continued their fight where there was Eagles versus Cowboys. Mad Dog seemed to have what looked like to me to be a sports almanac on the desk in front of him. It was more than just his usual newspapers. It was a very thick book. I think he's getting geared up for NFL season, Dan. Then Molly bought QBR into the discussion. Stephen A. does not like QBR. He said, get that out of here. I have seen so many teams win the Super Bowl with bad quarterbacks, to which Mad Dog then interrupted and yelled, but they had great defenses. And this team doesn't have a great defense. And then the debate ended. They went to commercial, and then Mad Dog turned to Jeff Sack and said, I think we won that 2 nothing." And Molly said, we had three topics, Mad Dog. Back to you, Dan. <laughs> Thank you, Billy. You were saying, Chris Cody, before you were interrupted by Stephen A. Smith's scream. I'm asking, like, this doesn't get you? Like, the, you have no interest in this? Is I think if Jake Paul's just not going to ever interest you. Like, I think this is interesting. Like, of all the fights he's had so far, it's the best striker. And it's, it'll, D Dana White has to take an L if Jake Paul wins this. Like, he's publicly said, there's like montage, Jake Paul put it out yesterday, of him being like, he'll never take the fight. So I'm just interested in that aspect. Of I'm it. not an absolutist about I won't f watch any of these things, and I don't mind the extravaganza. I don't. I want uh, I want events. I don't want to see Conor McGregor fight Floyd Mayweather oh. again. That, was a big that would be awesome. Yeah, that was, that was good. Uh, but no, this this would get my interest because I actually think he's got a better chance. Silva has a better chance of embarrassing Paul than Woodley uh, does, and it is it is the toughest of assignments. Even though he's fighting a, a forty plus guy who uh, who's not a boxer but is an excellent striker in that sport, and so um, and it's kind of like my theory with College Game Day. I don't really give a shit about the boxing. There Just let go. me put on a fight on Saturday night, invite some friends over, order some chicken wings. Like that's what I'm in it for. I don't like give a shit if it's like not the best quality boxing. He has to be fairly confident he's gonna win that fight, right? Because he canceled his last fight, and then there was like a whole like, well, you didn't drop enough weight, it wouldn't have been fair. While also going out and saying he wants to fight Conor McGregor, where Jake Paul is massively bigger than Conor McGregor is, so he has to feel like he can win this fight if he's yeah. gonna go through all of this. But well, doesn't he feel like he's gonna win every fight? Though? No, that I mean. He, he backed out of his last fight. And but that, was that him that backing was out, or was that like he that the guy was trying to do stuff with weight at the last second? No, so the Jake guy was, was like the guy was much bigger than him and didn't drop enough weight. And he's like, well, there's weight classes for a reason. It's like, well, there's only weight classes when the person's going to beat you. That is true because <laughs> Jake's been much bigger than most of his. He fought so Nate Robinson. Right, that is funny. The same it is class. funny that Jake was like, "Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa! This is not fair." <laughs> do, you think, do you think he took the last fight without knowing what his opponent looked like, and that was like, "Whoa!" What a great sentence from Tony. He fought Nate Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> 
Stugatz here, the numbers don't lie. In the last decade, over 4 million people have chosen Simply Safe Home Security to protect their home. I'm one of them. They must be doing something right. At Simply Safe, your safety is the only thing that matters. I know because I use Simply Safe in my own home. They protect you with cutting edge security technology powered by 24 7 professional monitoring agents who always have your back. We here at the Lebertard Show with Stugatz love our families, we love our yards. We travel a good amount, and Simply Safe makes it easier to check in on our homes and loved ones when we are not there. We also love a good perimeter check. Oh, do I love that. There's nothing better than a relaxing afternoon stroll around the yard just to make sure everything is where it's supposed to be. And Simply Safe makes this easier to do with their state of the art technology, crystal clear HD cameras when we are traveling. Customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash DLB. Save 20% on your Simply Safe security system when you sign up for an interactive monitoring plan and get your first month free. Visit simplysafe.com slash DLB to learn more. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Do you want to feel closer to your partner? With Trojan Bearskin Raw Condoms, you can get a closer, more natural experience while still providing the Trojan protection you can trust. Trojan Bare Skin Raw is America's thinnest latex condom, made from premium quality latex to help reduce the risk of pregnancy and STIs. You can still get that natural, more intimate experience you and your partner are looking for, all with the peace of mind backed by triple tested Trojan quality. Trojan Bear Skin Raw is available at major retailers nationwide. So buy a pack today to experience raw. Trojan Bear Skin Raw, as raw as it gets. Don Lebatard. Valedictorian. <laughs> Thank you, Roy. That's a tough one for Stugatz. Well, yeah. no, that's up. No, listen. What is second place? <laughs> do you know what second place is for a graduating high school senior if you don't get... Well, do you know what first place is? MVS, yep, most valuable senior. Do you know what it is to finish in second place, what it's called? Runner up. Runner up on graduating. <laughs> first loser. <laughs> Stugatz. The best graduating senior is the valedictorian. Ah, the Se VV. Why VV? I don't know. Is that how you spell it? Uh, you think it starts with two V's? <laughs> Silent V at the beginning. Yeah, oh, is that what? Yeah, of course. Everyone knows that. What do you mean the V? No, you're valedictorian. What, 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 what? Oh, he thinks it's valedictorian. <laughs> oh, no. It's not. Oh, man. I can't believe it. Because they won first place, Victoria. I mean, I spent my whole life thinking that. It's crazy. Second place. Uh, solutions. <laughs> Not map. <laughs> this is the Dan Lebatar show with the Stugats. We are presented by DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app today and use code DAN for a special offer when you sign up. That's code DAN only at DraftKings Sportsbook. And now, the SUI nominees for Best Story. Jay Leno, Rodney Dangerfield story. I had Rodney on in 2004, right before he died. And Rodney was in his 80s, and he's getting a little shaky. And he came out, and he's doing his stand-up. And he was off it, but you know, hey, I tell you. Uh, you're well, the hand was in the wrong place. It, I mean, I could tell something was wrong. I don't know if a regular audience member could. So while Rodney was doing his stand-up, I said to Debbie Vickers, our producer, I said, Call the paramedics. I think Rodney's having a stroke. She goes, really? I go, yeah, he's, he's sweating a little too much. He looks, I just think he's having a stroke. Call the paramedics. Okay. So Rodney finishes stand up, sits down. Jay, I tell you, I'm okay today. But last week, oh, I tell you, you know, you're like, this is all, nobody makes me laugh like that. So anyway, he does fine. The show ends. Rodney's in the dressing room. By that time, the paramedics have showed up. And I said, Rodney, the paramedics are here. They want to take a look at you. He goes, I'm fine. I'm fine. Now. Well, it turns out he did have a stroke. And they took him out in a stretcher. And Rodney went to the hospital. And about a day or so later, I got a call from Jonah's wife. She said, Jay Rodney's in a coma. Uh, we don't have much time he has left. Can you come by? I said, okay. So I run down the hospital and she says to me, Rodney's lying there with his eyes open. And she goes, Jay, I think Rodney can hear everything we say. 
but he can't respond. So I'm, I'm telling Rodney how much I love him and how much he meant to me and Seinfeld and all the guys, you know, and he was the one we all looked up to, you know. So then John says to me, Jay, put your finger in Rodney's hand. She goes, Rodney, if you know it's Jay, try to squeeze his finger. So I feel just a hint of a squeeze, you know. And I went, Rodney, that's not my finger. You know, <laughs> you know, you know? And Rodney went like this. <laughs> And he, I mean, he literally jumped and Joan screamed, he knew, he got, he got the joke, he got the joke. And I said, you know, and we all had a good laugh. And, and, and he, 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 he died right after that. And, and some people might, some people might think that's cruel, but you know, if you're a comic, if you're a comic, that's kind of what it is, you know? I mean, it, it was, it was really fun. It was, it was. <laughs> I mean, no, it is beautiful. It is beautiful. The guy who plays Elvis, the Kenosha Kingfish mascot, tells the story of A.J. Dillon knocking his mascot head off. So I get up, I turn around, I get hit. He's going like, Ugh. my head comes flying off. And so I'm just worried about all the all the kids in the stands who just saw headless Elvis. And so, you know, <laughs> so I, try, I try to get back to, to get my head on as quickly as possible. And um, yeah, right when I got hit, I was I was a little stunned. And so so I kind of got up. I kind of acted like it was supposed to happen. So I was like pumping up the crowd and stuff. And then um, the uh, mascot yeah. does. <laughs> You're good. Exactly yeah. what I was doing. Yeah, it's a real yeah. pro. Yeah, I just I just put, put the head back on, went back to the office to to recuperate a little bit. And then I, it wasn't the same the rest of the night, to be honest. Right. The energy or your your head? Your head was fuzzy. <laughs> I was just I was just out of it to be honest. That was the only thing I was thinking about. I was like I was walking around the ballpark. I was like everybody just saw me get annihilated by AJ <laughs> Dillon, and everybody's coming up to me. Oh, oh, you just got rocked. I was like, yeah. Did so, AJ apologize or? Yeah, he he apologized later. Right. I got an autograph uh, from him and George Love, who was also at the game. Nice. Um, I got a picture. And so, but I don't think he has any regrets, though. I'll say that. It was backup night at Kenosha. Van Lathan tells the story of his confrontation with Kanye West at TMZ. I didn't know that he was coming in that day. They had made this uh, interview with him. Uh, he was coming on TMZ Live, and I got told maybe 10 minutes before he walked in. And they said, all the mics are going to be down. It's going to be Harvey, Charles, and, and Kanye talking. But Kanye decided to inv invite everybody else in the room to be a part of the conversation. Like, he would say something, and he would be talking to them, and he would turn around, he would scream at everybody, blah, 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 whatever. And there was a part where he goes, he says, he also says some other stuff, too. He said, slavery, 400 years, that seemed like a choice to me. Okay, well, you know, we could, we could talk about that as people who have brains, and that's obviously stupid, right? Obviously demonstrates a vast ignorance when it comes to the history of slavery, to chattel slavery in America, to the slave trade itself, and to the generational bind that black people, his ancestors, mine and his ancestors were in. So he says that, I don't say anything. He turns around and he asks everybody. He goes, does it feel like I'm thinking freely right now? He said that to us. And I'm like, no. I'm, I'm like, you know how I was feeling? I was like, I'm glad you asked, mother No. It doesn't feel like you're thinking anything. It feels like you're just saying shit. And, the, and you're doing this and it hurts because you're a cultural hero. You're an icon. We gave you this big ass cultural gun. And we say, we said, yay, in your music and in everywhere else you go, go use it on the people that's looking at us wrong. You inspired me. You energized me. You gave me so much in the, you were out making songs about things that I felt like you couldn't make a hot rap song about. When they put the mic on you, you said George Bush doesn't care about black people. That's how we felt. By the way, it wasn't just black people. Do you know how many people in New Orleans, period, we was all some niggas at that point. Like, we're just the people in New Orleans, black, white, red, or green, that were like, yo, finally someone's being like, they not paying attention to what's happening with us down here, right? So I look, I'm really, when I said I'm disappointed, I'm hurt, and I'm appalled by what you've become, I meant it. And he listened. He like, he, 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 was, he was listening, so I think, a lot of people, number one, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a venue where people would have expected that to happen. No, no. <laughs> and then number two. It's it, a gentler. Uh, <laughs> I don't think of TMZ as gentle, but there, yes, I it, wouldn't expect. It a wasn't, uh, it, I, would, I would expect celebrity kiss ass. Right. It wasn't a venue where people expected that to happen. And number two, I don't think people had, because you only get little bits on there. I don't think people had seen enough of me 
to understood that I like had that in me. But after that, like life changed like right away. And just I, like that, right then. Right there, yeah. Bill Lawrence tells the story of how he decided to make a kind show with Ted Lasso. I told my daughter a story that there was, a, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave names out, there's a high school party when I was a, a senior in high school, and I uh, kissed a girl that I thought was single, but it turned out she was not single. She was back together with her boyfriend, who was one of those bullies that we all remember, but he was the kid from high school that would never leave town that didn't go on to college, you know, and and I zeroed in. I knew I was going to get beaten up because it was one of those horrible nights where everybody gathers outside of a party in a circle and they're going to watch you. It's like some rite of passage. And so they're all circled us. And I knew in my head, I'm like, all right, I'm going to let him hit me twice and then I'll, I'll go down and then hopefully it'll be over. He's a really big kid. And uh, he said, uh, go ahead, Lawrence, why don't you say something funny now? And I said, uh, uh, I said his name. I said, you know, I would say something funny, um, but someday you're going to be putting gas in my car. Oh, there it and is. And I said, and I might need regular. And if you put, before I got to the word unleaded, he hit me so hard that my friend said, I was wearing Dock Siders in Connecticut, shocker, that my friend said my Dock Siders were still in the same place, but without my feet in them. <laughs> <laughs> and because you had, and then, just, you had just hit him from the height of, like with the movie line of <laughs> condescension, the way that you would write it in a script if you were trying to be the dick yes. who was making yes. the, the young, the young man uh, infuriating him well, in a way that makes it earn that he hits you like here's that. the point of the story i go you, charlotte some people my daughter i could tell that as a, a a fun memory but when i was 24 i came home from la to connecticut and i was riding on the show friends and i got out of the car from the airport and he was mowing my lawn and he was working for a local landscaping company and it didn't feel good at all uh, i felt like a horrible person and a piece of garbage and our eyes met and i know that was a horrible moment for him because literally the last time we had had contact was me saying that to that guy and you could tell that story if you're a jerk of like and then he got his because i no, came but home you, my guess yeah. is that you probably wanted to go talk to him or I something wanted that you to, didn't, I, I didn't even just know, lock eyes i didn't wanted... even know how to do it man i was so young you know what i mean but it's a, literally a story that haunts me I, i'm telling it to you now i can see it like it was yesterday and i think that's the evolution as you grow up maybe away from the snark. Judd Apatow, Steve Martin's story. It's so funny because as a kid, you just don't understand, like you shouldn't walk up to people's homes. <laughs> you, know, like, <laughs> like you guys don't want like strangers, you know, listening to show, just walk it up to your house. And But I didn't know that at 13. So I just saw him outside his house and walked up to him and asked him for his autograph. And rightly he said, no, because I don't do that at my house. And so I sent him a letter and said, if he didn't send me a, Apology. I was going to send his address to Homes of the Stars, and he would have tour buses passing by. So you threat, so you're threat, a boy. You're actively threatening Steve Martin yeah. now for not giving you an autograph. But then he sent me a book, and it said, you know, he wrote in it, "To Judd, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was speaking to the Judd Apatow." And the funny thing about that—that's so crazy. That was 42 years ago. I'm old as shit. We all are. Stu Gatz, Kanye West story. It was the Super Bowl week. The Bears were down here playing, I believe, the Colts. Rex Grossman made yeah. a Super Bowl. It was Bears, Colts, Prince at halftime. And I told Joel, hey, let's just go get a shack at Fort Lauderdale. We'll broadcast from there. We'll do all the shows from there. We'll destroy the house. We agreed. He thought it was a good idea. And he came back to me five days later with a contract for the Versace mansion for a week. I mean, that's not what I wanted. And he told me to monetize it. He threw the contract on my desk. He said, monetize it. I said, did you sign the contract? I'd like to review it first. He said, it's already signed. Go monetize it. I'm like, how do you monetize a house? Like, what do you want me to do with it? Uh, but it was a great week. Like I, I slept in the house. Kanye West rented a room. I passed Kanye while I had to go to the bathroom one morning. He said hi to me. I said hi to him. I mean, it was amazing. It was a fun week. That also put us out of business. I mean, <laughs> well, you're, you're doing just fine and putting him out of business. <laughs> He's doing just fine as well, I think. I hope. He, he went to jail. <laughs> Wait, that was uh, while he owned the station, Roy. <laughs> 
stand-up comedian and friend of the show, Brad Williams, Hassan Minaj, celebrity basketball game story. Hassan Minaj is on my team, great comic, uh, a, a friend, and uh, Ray Allen is also on on our on our team. Mm -hmm. I had an assist to Ray Allen. It's one of the highlights of my life. So we're down in the game. Our team is down in the game, and then we then we start a ferocious comeback. Comedian Adam Ray had some points, and then we're coming back. Hassan steals the ball. Oh my God, we need a three to tie, and we need this three. He steals the ball. He's coming down. He has Ray Allen mm. on the wing. Don't don't say it. On the wing, not just any three-point right. shooter. Statistically, at the time, the greatest three-point shooter in the history of the NBA. Uh -huh. That's who he has on the wing. Brad, don't say it. Hassan, no, nah, I was on The Daily Show. <laughs> I did some one-man shows on Netflix. I got this shit. Hassan pulls up. He shoots the three. What do you think happens? He misses the three. Other team rebounds, and uh, we lose the game. Hassan. He looked off Ray Allen. You looked off, you looked off Jesus Shuttlesworth. <laughs> Tony Baselli, Tom Coughlin story. Playing for him, you learn to be on time. I, I mean, I got fined once because I was only three minutes early for the meeting. I, I, I mean, I wasn't five minutes early. I'm like, wait, the meeting isn't supposed to start. And he didn't care. I mean, you were getting fined. You know, he is a stickler. Jason McCourty's hilarious story about the day his brother Devin was drafted by the Patriots. So as the draft creeps closer and closer to the end of the draft, trades start happening. He goes to the bathroom and then boom, his phone rings. So I'm the closest one to him. I pick the phone up. Hey, how you doing, Devin? This is Mr. Kraft on the phone. So there's no time to sit there and say, well, hey, this isn't Dev. This is my brother. So I'm like, hey, Mr. Kraft, how you doing? Hey, we're going to take you to this next pick. Oh, I'm fired up. Can't wait to get to New England, blah, blah, blah. He goes, all right, I'm going to get ready. I'm going to hand uh, the phone over to Coach Belichick. That's when I ran to the bathroom, split the phone under the door. I had just spent a year. I had just spent a year. I had just spent a year in Tennessee and all the Belichick rumors. I'm just like, I don't want to talk to this guy on the phone. He's mean, whatever. So I slide the phone to Dev. So I don't, to this day, I don't know if, uh, if Robert Kraft knows that he actually drafted me uh, in, in the first round and my name wasn't on the check. So I guess it, did, it didn't really matter. Joe Buck, San Francisco Giants story. San Francisco, I remember I was packing up my backpack after a World Series game. Uh, at whatever it's called. Then it was, I think, AT&T Park. And this father and son were down there, and they're, Mr. Buck, Mr. Buck. And I'm packing my stuff up, and eventually I look over, and I wave to him, and this little kid and his father both gave me the finger, which was, <laughs> I'm sure, a moment that they talk about still to this day. I wanted to take the kid immediately away from his father uh, and just say, you need to do better, sir. But you know, At least it's not sitting with you, though, Joe. No, yeah. <laughs> right. No, that's true. Right. And, and uh, hey, whatever. As long as people know I'm there, I guess that's a mild win. Amin El Hassan, Rashid Wallace story. So we're playing the Pistons, and Rashid Wallace is in prime form, MFing every ref on every call. And not just, hey, where's the effing call? It's like, you blind, stupid mother effer, what are you looking at? Glenn's craft is closed two hours ago. You could have gotten that, like, just going off, and, then, and we're just playing. Amari um, Stoudemire goes up, gets fouled, no call, misses the, you know, misses the layup. Action's going the other way, goes, F and the ref goes T up. What? He said, showing up the ref disrespectful language. And we're like, dude, have you listened to Rasheed Wallace all game long? Has been running commentary, not just cussing, running commentary. And I shit you not. The ref says, Yeah, but that's just how she talks. <laughs> David Sampson, story of breaking Muhammad Ali's death. I got a call saying that Muhammad Ali was dead from a friend of mine. And I assumed that the family had announced that he was dead. So I called the people who do the Jumbotron and I said, let's do an ode to Muhammad Ali at the end of the game. They said, why? I said, he's dead. So we did a rest in peace with the picture of Muhammad Ali. And all of a sudden, PJ Laiello comes down to see me and says, David, he's not dead. We have to go to Louisville and kill him because the whole world thinks he's dead now. And then the side note to that story is I had to pay out of my own pocket $9,000 because in a rush to get it on the Jumbotron, we used an image of Muhammad Ali without permission of Getty 
Wow. It became worldwide news, and they sent us a bill for nine grand. I go, and I try to expense it with our CFO. He denies it. I go to Jeffrey to say, I am not paying this nine grand. He said, you announced Ali's death. Nine grand. I had to pay it. Amin El Hassan almost got got in Las Vegas. Grabbing a quick drink at Aria. Get a text from my buddy Vinny Goodwill. And Vinny says, hey, man, where you at? We're at Cosmo. I said, I'll be right there. So as I'm turning to leave, bump into a young lady. Okay. She makes a, a, a funny joke or whatever. And I say, ha-ha. And I make a joke, too, and exchange names. And next thing I know, there's a second one there. And then there's a third one there. And everyone's hanging off every word I'm saying. I'm like, mm, mm. Little my, my spidey sense is tingling. Your third eye started and to open my up. My third eye opened up and I saw what was happening. I saw the okie doke that was happening. And the giveaway was when I made a joke and I got the laugh and pat and the pat started at my shoulder <laughs> and ended somewhere <laughs> south of my pectoral. And I said, I need to go. Mm -mm -mm. You can't orchestrate a trap on me. I'm Steph Curry. I'll pass out and then I'll run to the corner. So you're safe. Like they, they almost they almost got you. They, they were talking about we got a limo and I'm like, oh that's nice. Like where are we going? I'm like, I don't know where we going. Oh, I gotta go to the bathroom. And she got the hell out of there. I'm telling you, man, Vegas is a dangerous place. Amino Hassan arguing with a cab driver story. I was in New York. A cab driver tried to not pick me up. I literally stepped out in traffic so he couldn't go by he told me oh i got a curb app appointment that's one of those uh it's like uber for taxis uber for taxis and i said show me show me the appointment on your phone and i'll get out of the way he said oh i can't because it's mountain and i said my cousin's recording he's coming to the side of the car show him and i'll get out of the way he couldn't show it so then it, we had like this standoff where he would like tiananmen square style like i'm just like this and he's you know like try to move and i'm like move to the left move to the right in front of him Stood there for like 10 minutes having an argument with this dude. Because I hate New York. I said, well, I'm, one of three things is going to happen. Number one, you have a curb app appointment. You show me that appointment, I'll get out of the way. Number two, you let me in this car and you'll give me a ride. Number three, you say, I don't pick up black people and then I'll get out of the way. This is escalated. It's it definitely escalated. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you were playing a game of chicken in the middle of the street with a, yeah. with a taxi cab, we were already there. So I end up getting in the cab, right? On the way, I'm just giving it to this guy. It's like this. It's you know, it's, it's illegal for you to do you're, this. You're actively fighting with a cab. Not driver. fighting. He's taking it because he's giving me lame excuses. Like, well, I had one, but then I canceled it for you. I'm like, you never mentioned that until we're in the car that you canceled the curb app appointment. I don't believe you, sir. I think you're full of shit. And I kept going and going. You were tough with the petition. At the end, at the end, tipped him twenty percent. You know, and I told him I'm tipping. You know why? Because you think black people are cheap or whatever. I'm here to tell you. Boom. Because I'm a nice guy. I'm a good guy. I'm tipping you. I'm also reporting your ass. Mm. Got out. Was on the phone with 311 for an hour. Ooh. An hour. Was it worth it or did you feel a little ridiculous after the hour? The rare tip no. with a negative oh, report. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. That man's yeah. Did you say I'm television's Mino Hassan? <laughs> Absolutely. After in the car? <laughs> yeah. I was like. <laughs> did you... Wait till I say your name on the jump. Oh. That's what no, you no, were saying? No, no. I said I'm, I'm on the <laughs> number one podcast. That's what you said? Yeah. No, you didn't. Number, I sure did. I dropped, I dropped it. I'm podcast is Amin El Hassan. Yeah, I yeah. dealt Levitard show. I said, you may not have heard of it, but trust me, millions have. Wait till right. steak sauces in your oh menchies. Oh, my God. Dan Levitard, story of being scared in his own house. I have vigorously and low to the ground sort of sumo squats, uh, you know, made a lot of noise, um, sort of rushing uh, forward to, to because I was scared, pay money not, to knowing, see this. not knowing if someone was there trying to make myself sound, uh, you know, like, a, like a, I guess a stampede of buffalo um, coming toward the intruder. So he would be more scared by what was coming down the hallway so than I was. You're walking on all fours to give the, uh, the illusion <laughs> that crab walking. Know, it, was, no, it wasn't crab walking. It was like like four, it was low to the ground, squatted Not down like, like a catcher, honest, like I mean. a catcher. No, but it was pretty low. A catcher, I mean, like a, yeah, well, just but but stomping on the ground in front of me, making a lot of noise. <laughs> like a defensive like stop. You just you came don't into know where the, it was three? still in the dark. There was no, there were no lights Is it on. Like Pitter patter steps. What are you no, doing? It's I mean. it's sort of a growling, grunting. I was a little scared, and I'm just sort of um, I don't know, trying to go towards somebody. Not crab walking with my arms behind me. 
but my arm's in front of me also banging on the ground. <laughs> like in a defensive the posture. The least intimidating like, thing no. I've ever heard. <laughs> what was it? Tell me it was a He's seagull. closing out on a three is what he's doing. He's I slapping the floor like he's playing for Duke. I mean, <laughs> don't you have a private elevator? Like, did you think someone parachuted in? How did they get there? I don't know. I was confused. Hockey player Scotty Upshaw tells us about his most intense hockey injuries. I played uh, roughly 14 playoff games with with a shattered thumb that just was like popped out of its socket. I had it just wrapped in it was in a cast the whole time. Uh, the worst one though was probably in South Florida. I popped my my ab bone off right right above the cock, Jesus. right off the bone, and it was <laughs> I couldn't get a I, I could Jesus. not get a hard on for <laughs> three months, boys. It was what? Not, Wait, it what? Was, and that's me talking. Trust me. Wow. Not perfect. <laughs> and he was taking four Cialis a day, and he still couldn't get one. No, it, was, <laughs> it wasn't having lunch at Mons Venus. It yeah, wasn't yeah. for the lack of blood flow. It just hurt too much. Yeah, well, wait till you turn 50. I mean. <laughs> Michelle Beadle had an embarrassing accident in her car. Accidents happen. Why do we judge it so harshly? I tried. I tried, I tried to get to the house. I was trying to do the right thing. You did your best. Were you running red lights? <laughs> you said you were like in a Marshalls or something. Where were you? I was at Marshalls when I knew something bad was about to happen. They don't have a bathroom. I didn't want to do that there. I didn't like. I, that's, I don't like doing that. Your car is much better. <laughs> <laughs> Todd McShay's story of his family getting legitimately mad at him for thinking Tim Tebow was going to be a bust. Tebow had no chance, in my opinion. That's what I. I mean, I got in a lot of trouble that year because everyone loved Tebow, and obviously the religious component to it, and. Even my mom was mad at me, but you know, I, I raised you better. I raised you better than this. And uh, she wouldn't even talk to me very much at Thanksgiving that year. Seriously. She was like mad. Her and my sister were legitimately mad at me because I was saying that he might not be a great NFL quarterback. I'm like, I, like this is what I do. This is my job. I but, uh, better than this. Is and I even, said. I'll never forget Tim Tebow's mom came up to me on no. after pro day down in Gainesville. And was like, I just want to let you know that I want to thank you and let you know that we're praying for you, you know, and I'm ah! thanking you because you've, you've given my, I swear, you, you're giving my, you've given my son so much motivation. Oh my it's God. Unbelievable. Michelle, yeah. you were the chip on uh, Tim Tebow's shoulder, you. Yeah, yeah, I was. I'm the reason he won that playoff game that year. <laughs> when Tebow throws that big touchdown in the playoffs to win the Broncos a game to Demarius Thomas overtime, his mom, his mom calling you and said, I told you, I told you, son. Yeah, she actually did. She actually did. <laughs> I'm not joking. She, my mom's a lunatic football fan. So she, oh my God. she was like, that's exactly what happens to you guys. I swear. I didn't know where you're going with that. That's she so called great. me after the game. It was like, I told you. Amino Hassan sharted his pants at a wedding. I'm out on the dance floor and I'm like, oh, no. no. Yeah, I'll let one rip real quick and then dance over there. And this is in <laughs> Florida in June. Oh, oh no. My God. What color were your pants? Light gray. Yeah, that's bad. Okay. Not anymore. <laughs> so I let it loose and I'm like, oh, that didn't feel right. But you know, the crazy thing about a shard is like, maybe it's just my mind. My mind played tricks. Yeah, you just don't know. So I quickly like go to the bathroom and the bathroom that I went to, I'll never forget this. It had a problem with the lock. The door either wouldn't lock or if it locked, it wouldn't unlock. So I locked it and then I dropped my pants and I realized, <laughs> yep, there it is. Okay, I need to do something. And then like someone knocked on the door, I'm like, I'm in here. And then I'm like, okay, how do I, I had one foot on the door, one foot out. So I grabbed some paper towels and I put it under my carriage, right? And then opened the door and then it was locked. I was like, oh, come on. And finally unlocked it. Then I left. I said, there's another bathroom upstairs. Go upstairs. The other bathroom was in the bridal suite. <gasps> but they're all outside. Yeah. Everyone's outside. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to this bathroom. Go in the bathroom, lock the door, take off the underwear. But this is the bridal suite. If I throw it away here, no, no. they're going to find shitty drawers, right? Can't do that. So I come up with the idea, like, this is what I'll do. I'll wash them in the sink. What? You know, I get like this some hand soaps, so I wash them, I wring them dry. Okay, so the damp, it'll be a little uncomfortable, but what's the worst that can happen? Put them on, put my pants on, go back outside. I asked my boy, I said, look, you're the only person I'm gonna tell this. My pants right now, does it look like they're wet? And he's like, yeah, it looks like you sat in a puddle. <laughs> like shit. Now the pants were not affected by the original, but the dampness from the underwear has now created an impression. Clearly. So now, I had to literally dance my way out of sight 
by crouching really low. And everyone's like, oh, it's such a great dance. I'm like, ha ha. <laughs> Until I get inside, indoors, because outside it's just like a fog. Like there's just nothing but steam. It's Florida in June. Oh. Inside, there's some air conditioning vents on the floor that are shooting air up. So I decided to stand over the vent. Smart. To try and dry it up. Real Marilyn Monroe moment. <laughs> Meanwhile, people are starting to complain it's too hot outside. So now people are coming in and they're asking me to move off the vent, stop hogging the vent. You're also putting your shit shit ass right over the <laughs> air source. Yeah. It's no longer a shit ass. I've cleaned it thoroughly. Well, it's still there. No, it's not. I use soap. You used hand soap. Hand soap. That's not clean <laughs> shit. So maybe it's not shit and lavender. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's exactly what it was. I'll have you know that hand soap is what they told us to use to fight COVID. So if it's good enough for COVID, it's good enough for the shit in my pants. Okay. That's a good comeback. I don't hate it. And then, you know, after a while it dried up and the rest of the night was magical. That's the first time I've told that story in public. 